Hey there friends, Dave Politis, k and Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our video channel. And this is a Bigfoot class, Bigfoot 101. And what I'm showing you is something truly remarkable. One of, uh, one of the villagers made this, and it's just absolutely stunning. And uh, thank you. It's beautiful. And... Uh, Angie and I both opened it and said, man, this is great. So, anyhow, we'll get on with the class and uh, talk about some other things. But, uh, we're very, very appreciative of everyone who does something like that. I mean, heck. Somebody else uh, sent in this, this toy for Huck, and she was already been wolfing away on it. And, uh, Thank you. And uh, Bigfoot movie, still doing, or Bigfoot movie, <laughs> UFO movie, Missing 411, the UFO connection, still doing good. Thank you. Thanks for all your comments during the last uh, several videos. Uh, I did get out into the environment the other day and filmed uh, the new segment outdoors up at uh, Hungry Horse Reservoir. Froze my petunias off. Yes, it was very cold. But this class, well, Dave, what's it going to be about? Well, that's a good question. So remember, this journey I've tried to explain is my story about how I got to the point of understanding this topic. And that involves walking in the path and understanding some of the periphery issues to Bigfoot and Sasquatch. Well, Dave, what do you mean? Well, when you think about Bigfoot, it, it takes on, it could be a myth in some people's minds. Uh, it could be a cryptid, meaning an unidentified animal. And then if it's a cryptid and it's an unidentified animal, then it falls into this category that a lot of people like to put it with other strange things that have been seen in the outdoors. Well, if it is a cryptid, as is pushed on us by the media and other researchers, then we need to understand those other animals too. Because how could they be here like Bigfoot and never be recovered, body never found, etc., etc., etc.? That's something that always haunted me. And what I mean by that, Ben and I always had these discussions. And we talk about if Bigfoot is here and it's an animal, then dad, it's the only animal in the world of its size that's never been caught filmed in the wild for extensive periods of times, behavior studied, etc., etc. I said, yeah, that's true. And being as big as it is, being as it leaves tremendous tracks, there's got to be something else there. Because how come more of us don't fall across this as we're hiking and Bigfoot sleeping. Well, people say, well, it did sleep in a cave. I heard that a thousand times when I first got it. Oh yeah, Dave, it's always going to be in a cave. Bigfoot is much smarter than that. Most caves have one entry, one exit, which means you get trapped. Not a good place to hide if you're somebody who doesn't want to be seen and doesn't want to be trapped. And there's a story out of uh, some caves in Nevada where it sounds like some Bigfoot got trapped and that's exactly what happened. They burned them and killed them there. And then their skulls and their hides disappeared. But that's just one example. Do I think they live in caves? No. Do I think they stay in caves? No. Now, other people have said that Bigfoot lives in trees. Interesting. 
And I had some pretty reputable people tell me that over time. Well, Dave, what do you mean? Well, when I was up in Northern California, up in the Redwoods, if you ever get up into the Redwoods in any area, look up high. And very high up under the tree, there's like a canopy, and it's like somebody laid a table on, across all the branches and the trunk of the tree, and you can't see past it. Sometimes it's a couple hundred feet up. It's like there's a layer up there of the trees. I have several people tell me, uh, some native and some not, that they had seen Bigfoots cr crawling up these redwood trees with their arms around the tree and just climbing up believable because these redwood trees have big indentations for bark and it'd be easy if you were strong enough to climb up exactly that way and to get up off the ground and to get to an area where people don't go it has some some validity to it coupled with the fact that many people have reported seeing bigfoot in trees kind of had my interest Now, when you talk about other topics along with Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster comes up, uh, the New Jersey Devil comes up, uh, Dog Man comes up, and they all fall into this realm, very similar to Bigfoot, where they're seen for a very short period of time, and then they're not. And even though law enforcement and others know that they were seen in a specific area, the ability to track and follow them is almost non-existent. Now, if it was an animal, that would not be the case. So, let me take you on this journey. Now, when I bought Ray Crow's research, he had a series of articles that were not in the newsletter, in the track record. We're not in the track record. By the way, this is the our USB that you buy that has like 3,000 pages of documents in it from the newsletter, 91 to 2007. But I want to read you some of these articles because this is what I was reading as I was formulating my thoughts on this. So this is the Bennington Evening Banner in Vermont July 3rd, 1924, Dateline Orange County, New Jersey, or Orange, New Jersey, said, the lieutenant in charge of the West Orange, New Jersey police station answered the telephone yesterday afternoon and found that patrolman George Deckenbach and a lot of, had a lot of excitement and were on the wire. Say, that policeman say, I just seen something. The lieutenant immediately motioned to three policemen on reserve and they piled into the station house and automobile and went roaring away to the patrolman Dreckenbach's post while the policeman continued. I just seen an animal that has a head like a deer, runs like a rabbit, and has fiery eyes. What do you think it is? The lieutenant talked as soothingly as possible, meanwhile writing a note to another policeman to bring Chief Patrick Dono by the time the chief arrived, the three reserves came back with patrolman Deckenbach sitting with them in their automobile. Deckenbach launched into a description of the strange animal he had seen, while the others patted him on the back and told him not to worry. Deckenbach was beginning to think they weren't believing him when Mrs. Clyde Vincent of Pleasant Valley came breathless into the police station with her two kids. Lieutenant, she said, finally, we were panicking on the road while... A while ago, when an animal that had a head like a deer, ran like a rabbit, and fiery eyes came along and jumped over us. Jumped over us. Lieutenant, she said finally, we were picnicking on the road a while ago when an animal that had a... They just described it. Later, Patrolman Deckenbach received further vindication when Chief James Ashby of the Livingston Police telephoned that a farmer there had reported seeing the devil jumping about his fields. Several policemen and 50 boys passed the rest of the afternoon searching for the creature, but unsuccessfully. The West Orange police think that the animal is a kangaroo that escaped from a circus zoo, though they are stumped by the fiery red eyes. Yeah, 
I'd be stumped too. Part of the point of this, three different police stations all in this area jump up and they start responding to the area. Okay. They're probably bringing in canines with them. Perfect. <clears throat> and they go out and they try to find any evidence of the thing. Of the thing. Most commonly, they'll find tracks, some weird tracks. Now, this thing was later called the New Jersey Devil. There's a hockey team named after him. A couple of X-Files episodes about it. And there's actually a big conference out there about exactly this. And it happened at various increments of time where you couldn't track it, you couldn't guarantee it'd be anywhere. And people always went about the research of it, thinking of it as a normal animal that was reclusive. Okay, I understand that. Let's go on. The Belleville News Democrat, September 26, 1950. Strange animal eludes sheriff. The sheriff's office conducted an extensive search at Rice Schneider's Timber, three miles south of Belleville and near Mulligan Lane yesterday afternoon for a strange animal, but the animal eluded officers. Henry Grossman, a federal or a veteran squirrel hunter at 419 South First, swore he spotted the animal yesterday afternoon. He said a friend had told him Sunday about the strange combination of a kangaroo, dog, and bear that he wanted to make certain before making a report. So I went there myself, and sure enough, I saw it, he told Deputy William Schoenborn. Schoenborn and other deputies spent a couple of hours scouring the woods. They returned with the report. Nothing unusual sighted. Hang in there. The Sentinel, February 16th, 1924. Strange animal attacks two men. Vainly attempts to leap on running board of auto, Westchester, Pennsylvania. Park Patrick, director of the Westchester Band and a post office employee, and Herbert, Herbert Andrus, a rural carrier, tell a story of being attacked on the road north of this place by a strange animal which disputed the passage of the automobile and drove Andrus to the car when he attacked it with a starting crank. That's what it says. Then, it then followed the car to the golf grounds at a distance of a half mile and attempted several times to board it, leaping on the running board from which it was beaten back with the crank. The men described the animal as a raccoon of enormous size, but admitted they may have been mistaken because of the excitement. Local coon hunters declare such an animal has never been known to attack a human being and are inclined to believe it has a bobcat which had wandered to a section in the mountains as the animals have been known to do in former winter seasons. So first of all, a raccoon and a bobcat look totally different. And a giant raccoon, I think that most people have seen raccoons, and I think that somebody who had someone jump on its running board would know what it was. If you notice, in magazine and news articles that want to make a funny about an observation such as this. What they'll say is a bunch of ha ha, he he, ho ho. And then they'll state, well, it was obviously identified wrong. That's what they'll say. And in your mind, with a news source, it used to be that you trusted them. And when somebody said something like that, you thought, well, maybe they interviewed the person and there must be something to it that shouldn't be justified. So I kind of get it and I'll discount it. Think about the way a news agency or a reporter handles a story. Does it give it respect and dignity? Do they respect and dignify the person who's making the report? And if they don't, then what are the chances anybody else who saw the way that person was treated would want to report anything. Giddy up. So, in some parts of the world, some reporters aren't smart enough to really understand what's happening in front of them. And so they're uncomfortable with the story and they'll make a funny about it. 
And we've all seen this happen many times. This is Delaware County, January 22nd, 1909, Friday. It had what? It had wings like a bat and was chased by a squad of policemen. The strange animal or bird, which is terrorizing several sections of the city, made its appearance last night in the 10th Ward. A respected citizen of that ward who resides at 3rd and Jeffrey Streets on his way home from the 9th Street trolley line at 10.30 had his attention a distracted by a strange noises on the roof of the sheds of Robinson's Brickyard. Suddenly there was a floundering and a struggling in the center of the Ingle Street, and out of the confusion there rose a strange-looking animal, half beast and half bird, with wings like that of a bat and a long tail, end of which looked like the point of an arrow. The weather was very foggy, but by the glare of the electric lights and the citizens saw strange-looking animal fly down Ingle Street. As it neared the elevated railroad, it seemed to rise like a big airship and passed over the tracks just as a northbound express train was passing. Whether it be a beast or a bird, it was of sufficient size to cause this engineer to sound a sharp danger signal from the whistle. The strange creature was next seen soaring over the top of the borough hall and alighted near the public school building at 3rd and Jeffrey Streets. At this point, several of the police officers started to pursuit of the beast or the bird or whatever it is. They gave chase up at Commerce Street to the rear of the undertaking establishment of Thomas Minshall, where the animal was lost in the fog. Weather. The tracks of the creature could be plainly followed in the snow and people living in the neighborhood say that they heard distinctly the rustle of twigs and the clatter of strange feet at a late hour. The examination revealed the fact that several of the telephone wires were torn down, and it is supposed that this was done by the animal coming in contact with the cables. J. Vernon Williams, a roadmaster for Middletown Township, is reported to have seen the devil, or by whatever name one wishes to call this strange animal, which made its appearance in this city a few days ago. Mr. Williams says that at about 2 o'clock this morning, he was awakened by the noises made by three dogs. Going to the window, he observed the dogs running about a peculiar kind of animal. All apparently afraid. Yeah, I can understand why I was afraid. I'd be afraid. But when you have this New Jersey devil issue that goes on for decades. No evidence, no photos to speak of. It's seen in downtown areas. It's seen in urban areas. So you know, especially when trained observers like police are seeing it and confirming it, there's something real out there going on. Don't discount it. So we move on. Mountains scoured. Now we'll pass on that for right now. This is a good one. Nova Scotia, Canada. February 20th, 1880. Over 1,700 barrels and crates of potatoes were shipped to West India Port yesterday, besides a large quantity of dry and pickled fish, lumber, hay, and and oats. Ten cars of sugar were shipped to the Montreal yesterday. The annual meeting of shareholders commenced and the turn of a vote. Joseph A. MacDonald, age 22 of Bridgeville, P2, and 25 of Maitland, were killed by an accident at the Silver Mine in Howland, California on the 19th. A strange animal has been seen in the woods near Barney's River, Picton, B-A-R-N-A-Y-S River in Pictou. P-I-C-T-O-U, is described as walking erect in a body like the form of a man and having a head resembling a monkey and a body like that of a human being. Nova Scotia, 1880, February 20th, in the Gazette. Well, we kind of know what that could be, right? But again, it shows in far reaches of North America, they're still reporting this as early as that. 
Mount Carmel, September 3rd, 1924. Strange animal has driven away all the deer. Well, that's peculiar. A strange animal has driven away all the deer in the section across from the Lehigh River to seek safety in the White Haven region. Local hunters who believe the animal is either a very large wild cat or a mountain lion have been doing their best to get a shot at it, but without success. Several parties have been organized and the nearby woods and mountains scoured without a sight. Farmer claims to have seen the animal near Mud Run, but could not describe it accurately. Dogs that have never before shown fear refuse to go into the sections where it is believed the animal has its rendezvous. Now, there's something about these unusual type of animals, cryptids, whatever you want to call them, that dogs sense, mm -mm, don't want to go near that. So is it something pheromone-wise? Is it something electronic-wise? Not sure. But that's another consistency in all of these unusual animals. Stay with me. The Tipton Times, January 11, 1924, killed strange animal. Marion Huff, north of town, killed a strange animal on Christmas Eve night. The animal was larger than a year old hound, had a head like a house cat, but broader, short front legs, huge claws, long hind legs. Mr. F stated that the animal left tracks of the feet and a part of the legs also. He shot the animal twice and then the hound had a difficult time killing it. Mr. Huff is anxious to learn what kind of an animal he was killed. The leader is of the opinion that it is a bobcat, species which very weird and uh, and rare in this area. Probably right. The point being, it's pretty well identified. Next one, The Age, May 4th, 1880. So this is a European news article. This one is from Adelaide, Australia. Strange animal. Additional particulars have been received of the existence of a strange animal at large on York's Peninsula. The report received a few months ago represented the animal as being like a large, hairy man. The latest account is as to the frightening of settlers' horses during the night. The tracks, as of an enormous kangaroo, were discovered in the morning, jumping four to six inches. The aboriginals speak of a big one fellow-like man along the scrub. The first report was discredited, but the latest furnishes reason for thinking that some unknown animal is in the scrub. The settlers are talking about on organizing a party to search it. The matter has been much excitement on the peninsula. Now, the other thing we don't really know about this is how much of the story was scrubbed before they actually wrote it. People in the newsroom thinking, oh, this is, this is too bizarre, it can't be true. I'm not gonna risk the credibility of my newspaper over that. The Morning Post, September 10th, 1825. Oh, gentlemen, direct from Oxford, called on us last Saturday and informed that two brothers, one about 18 and the other only 12 years of age, went into the woods about five miles below Oxford on Thursday the 12th with two rifles and discovered a strange animal about 30 yards distance from them. The oldest boy fired and wounded him in the beast in, in the breast and shoulder. He turned and made furiously towards the one who shot him. The oldest then called for his brother's rifle who was about six rods distance. The younger brother started with his rifle towards him but finding that the animal would be too quick for him, had leveled his rifle himself and brought him to the ground with a ball through the head. He was brought in and measured when he was found to be eight feet in length from the end of the nose to the root of the tail, which was five feet long, making 13 feet total. He was three feet, four inches high when standing, the body about the size of a man's. He was of red, didn't color, had a face like a monkey, body like a panther, feet like a deer, and tail like a wolf. Interesting description, remember? 
So where are these things coming from? Keep that thought. This is the Ottawa Citizen, March 13th, 1958. A strange animal resembling a human being has been captured near the South Sumatra village of Pabumul. The Netherlands news agency reported today from Jakarta. The report said the animal, a female, was estimated to be 17 years old and was completely covered with short hair. There have been previous reports that a creature resembling man roams the dense jungles of South Sumatra. Many years ago, the former Netherlands administration offered a reward to anyone who captured the beast called Sindai, S-I-N-D-A-I. The new report said that the military commander of South Sumatra is showing great interest in the animal and has sent a special courier to the village to bring it back to Palembang, the capital of South Sumatra. Pretty interesting. 17 years old, completely covered in hair. How many things can that be that walks like a human? Now, the first time I read this, I thought, well, that's pretty weird. Now, I have heard of sea creatures in freshwater lakes. That's not that unusual. In fact, in Alaska, there was a show that did a special about that. And the ongoing thought was, is that whatever this creature was, must have come from the ocean. But now listen to this one. It's pretty bizarre. Spokane Chronicle, September 15th, 1905. Sea serpent in Oregon Lake. Alleged the head of an animal is as big as a wash tub. A strange looking animal resembling descriptions of sea serpents has been seen in the waters of Crescent Lake in the Cascade Mountains, over 100 miles east of Eugene. Just across the line in Crook County, alleges a uh, European Oregon, Eugene, Oregon report. A party of Eugene hunters have returned from there and tell the story of how they encountered the monster in the lake. They were fishing out in the middle of the lake when suddenly a huge form loomed up out of the water directly in front of them and after splashing for a minute or more sank into the site. The next day the same performance was repeated. According to the story of the hunters, the monster was probably 30 feet long with a head as big as an ordinary wash tub. This strange story was credited by many Eugene people in years past. From time to time, the same creature or others similar have been seen in the lake and the descriptions given by all who claim to have seen it are precisely alike. The Indians of the Warm Springs Agency who frequently hunt that vicinity, vicinity often tell of having seen the mysterious creature dis, disporting itself in the waters of the lake. Did I believe it? Yes, I do. And Dave, why do you believe it? Well, I'll go into the story a little bit now. A year ago, not this last summer, but the summer before, in the fall, Angie and I are out on uh, Flathead Lake with the Housers, who own, own the Montana Vortex. And we're fishing. And we're, we're going up the north side of the lake on the south fork of the Flathead River, and we're going north in the river. And we're about a mile and a half north of the lake in the river. And there was this portion where we knew that there were a lot of fish in this deep hole. And we we're kind of hovering in the hole in the boat. The current wasn't real bad. And we have the fish finder on. And I look at it. And something about a majority of the fish finder is, you know, this one item. And I said, Joe! He jumps over the seats, gets there, and we're both watching the fish finder. And what we see, <laughs> and God is my witness on this, and I mean that in the utmost of respect. What's going through the fish finder is this giant snake looking thing. And the best I could describe it is it, based on the fish size that were around it, I would say it was at least uh, 18 inches round as it moved. And it lasted on screen maybe 12, 15 seconds and it was gone. We, we made up and down loops of the river trying to find it again, couldn't. 
Now, what's interesting about this is there is a story of a giant thing very similar to what we saw in Flathead Lake. I did a bunch of research and I could never find anyone who reported it in the river, but we weren't very far from the lake. And Joe and I both agreed it had to be that. It had to be that. And it was in an area where there was a lot of fish, so I'm sure it was feeding. A million dollar question is, well, what was it? <laughs> now, it's obviously no known big snake that we know of. Why? Because the water temperature in that area at that time would have probably been 55 degrees, maybe. It was down about 25, 30 feet. The lake and the river never gets real warm, even in the summer. And for it to survive in that lake during the winter, lake temperatures get down to 30, 35 degrees. There's no known snake that large that we know of that could survive in that environment. So what is it? The, fun, the thing I thought was so strange, and Andy, Angie and I talked about it later, is that of all the times I've been out fishing, I'm not with Joe that much. Uh, I mean, he runs his business during the summer, and uh, I'm out there fishing all the time in the summer, but we happen to be together to see that. Very strange. So, the Indianapolis Star, June 8th, 1999. Scientists will travel to Africa in search of the Congo dinosaur. Manchester, England. Centuries of peace have come to an end next year for a huge and lonely vegetarian reptile which has been targeted by British explorers. They pronounce it M O or it's spelled M O K E L E dash M M B E M B E. Or Stopper of Rivers is the number one candidate for the title of living dinosaur after several reported sightings in the swamps of the upper Congo River. Described by local people as half elephant, half dragon, the creature now faces the most determined attempt yet to track it down. Sightings emphasizing a snake-like neck, a crocodilian armor, and a diet of plants date back to 1776, but scientific proof still is awaited. It may sound like the Loch Ness Monster, but there are two important differences, said Adam Davies, 29, whose Manchester-based team is joining a Swedish expert in rare reptiles to hunt for the creature. The first is that we are talking about a large and sparsely inhabited area. The swamps are twice the size of Belgium. And secondly, there hasn't been any real change in the region in the last 60 million years. Christened, christened Dino 2000, the three-month search will start next summer on the edge of the unmapped swamp in Lakula in the northern Congo Republic. A fuzzy picture of the 30-foot creature was taken in the area in 83 by Marcelin Agnagna, a zoologist from Brazzaville in the Congo capital. Recordings were also made nearby of a large animal leaping into the water close to a mud wallow where clear prints have been found. The Mokeli is one of the body of grails of cryptozoology, the study of dubious but not completely implausible creatures, Davy said. The entirely new large mammals are still being found most recently in antelope in Vietnam. Those skeptical about the Congo dinosaur include the explorer and writer Redmond O'Hanlon, who risked sweat-sucking bees and feverish priests on his search for the creature five years ago. He concluded that the sightings were of elephants foraging rivers using their tusks as snorkels or probably swimming pythons. Davies' colleagues are experts in cryptozoology. They reconnected the two areas two years ago, but had not turned back because of civil war in the region. Another Mokeli sightings include reports of an aerial video of disturbances in the water on Lake Telly, taken by a Japanese film crew in 92. Sorry, friends. To me, sounds plausible. But why hasn't something that large been seen more regularly? Uh, 
if it lives there, then why not put a helicopter up and do grid patterns of the area? Or something even less expensive now, put up a drone and do grid patterns of the area and slowly just take it down and find out where it is. The reason being, as with all of these topics, you can have tracks, you can have sightings, and you can sometimes have photographs. But past that, really not there. You have to ask yourself, why? Calgary Herald, November 18th, 1921. Expedition is being watched with interest. Important research being made by the Royal Geographic Society. So that was in England. We have the National Geographic Society here, both highly reputable organizations back in the early 1900s. The progress of the Royal Geographic Society's expedition to Mount Everest under the leadership of Colonel Howard Burry is being watched with keen interest by scientists, especially at the Natural History Museum, South Kensington, to watch the spoils will be brought for study and classification for the return of the party. One statement in Colonel Burry's dispatch has excited special curiosity. It is hoped that may be satisfied by further discoveries of the course of the expedition. Even at these, high, even at these heights, the expedition, 20,000 feet, writes Colonel Burry, there were curious tracks in the snow. We distinguished hare and fox tracks, but one mark like that of a human foot was most puzzling. The coolies assured me that it was the track of a wild, hairy man, and that these men were occasionally to be found in the wildest and most inaccessible mountains. Calgary Herald, November 18th, 1921. Himalayas. And this one, good one. The province, January 15th, 1944. Wild men of British Columbia. From time to time, the Indians of British Columbia tell their white brethren curious tales of hairy men while they have met in the mountains, solitude, and other lonely places of the West. Most old timers have heard such stories and have dismissed such yarns without further thought. Persistent reports of this nature come from the neighborhood of Harrison Hot Springs and the CPR mainline 70 miles north of Vancouver. The Indians know these creatures as Susquatch. They pronounce that sus, S-U-S. Hold your taters for a second. Did you catch that name? Harrison Hot Springs. And where's that? The far southern area of Harrison Lake, British Columbia. And why is that important? Because the first story in our movie, Missing 411, The UFO Connection, was filmed at Harrison Lake. And why is that important? It's a very deep lake, a very long lake, and a very long history. And in the movie, we presented uh, a report, a CIA report, of something that was stunning at that lake. An Indian woman of the Harrison Lake tribe, while engaged in domestic duties, turned suddenly and saw standing a few feet away a giant hairy wild man, different from any human creature she knew of. He made a step towards her with muscular arms ready to clutch her, but abruptly changed his mind and fled with great bounds, making vocal noises, which she said sounded as if they were both amused and fearful. Another case of an Indian entering a log cabin was knocked down by a creature that rushed out and away. The hunter scrambled to his feet and raised his gun to shoot, only to lower the weapon with wonder and fear when he saw not an animal rushing away, but a gigantic, hairy, wild man. The creature walked quickly in a sort of half-trot towards cover, glancing over his shoulder in the trembling figure of the doorway. Another occasion, two natives passing along a trail were startled by big stones thrown on the path in front of them from the cliff above. On looking up, they saw two Sasquatch, S-U-S-Q-U-A-T-C-H, leering at them over the edge of the cliff. Remember, this is 1944, folks. One of the natives, a more than usually intelligent man, thought that the Susquatch were trying in a half-fearful, tentative way to make advances towards getting acquainted. Retreating hastily, the Indians looked back to note the nonplussed attitude of the wild men whose gestures seemed to be an invitation to return. In all cases, the Susquatch took the Indians' unwariness, 
showing that they were more alert than the natives and knew something of their habits. When the Indians saw monkeys, they immediately said that the wild men they had seen were big monkeys among several of the northern tribes, notably the Twimpians and the neighborhood of the Skeena River and Prince Rupert. These wild men are known as Buckwas, B-U-C-K-W-S, Indian name for a monkey. The missionaries considered the wild men, if they existed at all, were human beings lost in the mountains or wrecked on the coast who had become demented, admitting that in some cases this might be true, the Indians tried to capture any wild man. It was said that someone had recognized a lost son in one of these strange creatures. However, as attempts to capture him failed, the distracted father gave orders that he should be shot to end his suffering. <laughs> According to one theory, the wild men of the Indian tales are creatures of another order of existence actually seen by Indians who happened at the time to be in a psychic condition that enabled them to see with all the assurances of reality the inhabitants of another plane. Kaching. Did you catch that? The most important paragraph I've read so far. Let me read this again. According to one theory, the wild men of the Indian tales are creatures of another order of existence, actually seen by Indians who happened to be at the time to be in a psychic condition that enabled them to see with all of the assurance of reality the inhabitants of another plane. Another plane probably means another dimension in our world today. Occult writings refer to the existence of remnants of the Lemurian races in secluded spots around the Pacific Rim. And I did a show about this for the History Channel called Vanished. And under Mount Shasta, there's supposedly a group of Lemurians. Notably on the slopes of Mount Shasta and in parts of Alaska. If any credence can be placed in these references, they suggest the possible existence of a subterranean race in British Columbia of a very primitive character, some of whose members have contrived from time to time to reach the surface. In this connection, it is considered a coincidence that the wild men have usually been met at night or in twilight. The Susquatch stories have attracted the attention of a group of science students in Oregon, being familiar with the references to Lemurian colonies on the Pacific coast. They have talked about organizing a search in the neighborhood of Harrison Lake. If these intentions are carried out, more may be heard about the Sasquatch. There you go, folks. Why is all that important? Because there are these little glimpses into reality in some of these very, very old stories. And this is super important. Because back in 1944, they didn't have physicists talking about other dimensions and other worlds, but they had Native Americans and First Nations people talking about it, and that was the evidence right there. Story, 1981. Bigfoot-like space alien lands his own flying saucer on an isolated mountain. Mountain. In one of the most bizarre UFO encounters ever, two prominent men witnessed a Bigfoot-like creature climb aboard a flying saucer and zoom off at a blinding rate of speed. The two Chilean men stumbled across the incredible space alien and his amazing flying craft while hiking through a remote area of the Andes Mountains last year. They remained silent about the incident until now for fear of ridicule and endangering their jobs. As we neared a clearing, suddenly we saw a cigar-shaped metal vehicle with a flat top. It measured about 40 feet by 10 feet and was about 80 yards away, a respected architect, Oscar Zamoro, told the news. At first we thought we had stumbled upon a military installation, but when we walked around to the other side of the craft looking for insignias, we were shocked to see a hairy human-looking creature at least six feet tall. It could have been mistaken for a gorilla except for the human-shaped head and body and face. Besides the dark hair, the strangest thing about him was that he had no discernible neck. 
Luckily, the creature didn't see us, and we quietly slipped back behind cover of rocks, and we watched for about 15 minutes. The creature stood still, and there was no movement from inside the craft. Finally, we decided to move closer. Suddenly, a metal ladder descended, and the creature began to climb it. Within seconds, he was inside the craft and started silently ascend. It rose like a helicopter. It was about 20 yards off the ground. We were almost blinded by the glaring white, red, and yellow lights which illuminated the mountainside. After a few seconds, the craft disappeared at incredible speed, leaving only vegetation behind. The other witness, a judge, said, If you promise me confidentially, I will state that there is no question in my mind. Whatever what we saw that craft and a strange hairy creature and that both are definitely not of this world. I'm still reluctant to talk about the experience to anyone because I don't want to go on record as a man who had lost his head, the judge added. That's the article. June 2nd, 1981 is when the incident happened. The, uh, why are those important? Well, it puts two of the biggest categories in the world together. And when the First Nations people said they were other, uh, from another dimension or another world or another plane of existence, different words can mean different things, but the same word can mean many things. Dayton Daily News, March 5th, 1989. Unusual sightings bewilder visitors to Chestnut Ridge, Pennsylvania. Bigfoot walks, UFOs fly, many claim. Latrobe, Pennsylvania. Bob France, a mountain man, lives in a log cabin with a stockade gate to keep the world at bay, snares snakes for fun. The woods and its denizens are familiar to him as the calluses on his hand. Then one day, Bob France went into the dark, teeming woods, and familiarity slipped away, for he had entered another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind, a dimension known as Chestnut Ridge. And this is just south and east of Pittsburgh. The stretch of the Allegheny, Allegheny Mountain foothills, running from West Virginia up through the Westmoreland and Indiana counties is Pennsylvania's twilight zone. It was on Chestnut Ridge that France saw the creature that he has come to think of as Bigfoot. I know it's there, he said recently, of the tall, hairy, neither man nor animal that he says he has encountered six or seven times along the ridge, either glimpsing it through the brush, smelling its rancid emanation, or sensing its eyes following him as he walked. I can feel it. And it was near a Chestnut Ridge hollow called Death Valley, he would tell you, as a matter of factly, as if he were mentioning a bear or a deer that he saw a UFO. It was cigar-shaped, and it flew up and darted away in zigzags. He took showing a blurry photograph he took that night of the moon in the starless sky. It'd be easy to dismiss Francis' stories if it were only one to tell, but over the years, hundreds of people have reported seeing similar eerie, even unearthly things along Chestnut Ridge. To be sure, scattered reports of UFOs and Bigfoot come in from across the state, but the one place where the reports have consistently accumulated is along the ridge. And over the last 18 months, the number of sightings has been on the upswing. With so many of your friends and neighbors swear they have seen something, even skeptics hedge their bets. When I see it, I believe it, said Kim Opatka, who covers the UFO and Bigfoot beat for a local newspaper, the Latrobe Bulletin which publishes stories about the sightings as routinely, routinely as some newspapers cover traffic. But I do, these pe do believe these people see something. Now the paper talks about Stan Gordon. I've talked about this book before. Stan's a good friend, super smart guy, and a lot like me. States the facts, doesn't give a lot of opinions. He wrote the book Silent Invasion, the Pennsylvania UFO Bigfoot Casebook. Stan Gordon, an electronic salesman, runs the Pennsylvania Association for the Study of the Unexplained out of his Greensburg, PA basement. 
The hill over there is where Bigfoot was first seen in 72, Gordon said one day recently, sitting on the coffee shop of Greensburg Sheraton Hotel as he looked out a window across the shopping mall. The people who lived there one night heard unusual animal screams. When they heard something heavy walking, someone saw lights coming in and hovering over a cemetery. Then the lights sped away. The next morning, one family found a large footprint in the dust. It had five toes and was larger than human. Now, we don't want to say that Bigfoot is coming out of a UFO mostly. Bigfoot and UFOs are seen separately. Only in the very small number of cases are both seen at the same time. According to reports Gordon has collected, witnesses consistently describe Bigfoot as long hair, foul smelling, six to eight feet, walks on two legs, has eyes that glow red in the dark, and arms that hang down below the knees. If it makes any noise at all, witnesses have likened it to a baby crying or a bird chirping. UFO descriptions, however, have changed over the years. In the mid-40s and 50s, most people reported saucers, Gordon said. Now they say they see cigar shapes and triangles. Look, right here. He said he has heard at least 28 Bigfoot sightings throughout Pennsylvania in 1988 alone, and he was not even had time to tally the reported UFOs that cannot be immediately discounted for explainable phenomena such as meteors, aircraft lights, and the ridge. The ridge seems to be a window for this kind of thing, Gordon said, but we don't know why. One theory is that it's magnetic forces. All we know for sure is that the area is producing a higher level of this phenomena for some reason. More than 30 caves have been discovered at the low mountains covered this particular area. It's a soundless saucer. Bill Descani was living in the trailer home along the edge of the ridge in 68 when he looked outside before retiring for the night and saw what today he insists was a flying saucer. It was like a round football field sliding by 100 feet over my head. Motionless, noiseless, said Descani. The bottom was open and I could see inside these people walked out, sliding glass window and stood in front of the railing. They kind of look like humans, just like us. When they saw me, they went back inside. The Scotty's wife confirmed the encounter. Like, unlike the Scotty, many people who say they have encountered Bigfoot or UFOs are ashamed to have their names publicized. They say they are belittled and they have their sobriety and sanity questioned. And therein is one of the issues on getting credible people to talk about the topic. And I think that's a strategy by news agencies. Let's ridicule the people. Let's keep the, the story down low. Let's not talk about it. Let's let the foolish people come up and get in front of the news and nobody will really believe it because these people look too foolish. It's kind of the strategy. Now, Chestnut Ridge. Yeah, Bigfoot and UFO have been seen in the same area at the same time. I gave you an article who saw Bigfoot going into a UFO. One was a judge, one was an architect who saw it. So, time and place. Same, same area. Same time. Same creature. Same craft. No evidence. Now, UFOs, we have some pretty good photographic evidence, that's for sure. But if there is something besides that, our government holds it and doesn't want to tell us. Why would that be? It's our government. Don't we own what our government owns? Are we entitled to know the truth? Tim Burchett, a congressman from Tennessee, he's a friend. I've met with him in his offices. A very rational person. And he says that there's been a cover-up about UFOs for decades. And he comes right out and says it. And he said it in the news just the other day. It's refreshing to hear a legislator come out and say that straight up. And he wants it to be revealed. The point of the show today. When I started to read all of these things, all these different entities, flying birds, the New Jersey Devil, uh, Ogopogo in Canada, uh, Loch Ness Monster, the Bigfoot, it goes on. But the commonalities, no specimen, multiple witnesses, 
some evidence tracks, few photographs, elusive, nothing could be predicted about these things. Yet if they had migratory patterns or they could be predicted, they would have been studied and they can't be. None of this could be studied. Now in the movie, I was talking to John D'Souza, retired FBI agent, who actually researched all the stuff I'm telling you about. And that first year of the X-Files was based on his case files. I couldn't believe it. They said it. And John said, Dave, all of these things are multi-dimensional. They somehow have the ability to move from our time and space into another. And he said that it, their agency doesn't want to know about it. He was put on these cases because of a multitude of reasons. Missing people or people were afraid or favors for others. And he said when he came out with his reports, oftentimes he was told to redact them or to change them because the powers to be don't want it out there. They don't want you to know. Well, that's pretty suspicious. <laughs> I mean, here we have a government employee, John, FBI agent, collecting facts, putting it in a report, and his supervisor saying, we don't want to know that. Take it out. I asked John, that bother you? He said, yeah, a lot. So, again, I don't mean to be repetitive, but when I was filming Vanished, they sent me to Wisconsin and I met with Dr. John Brandenburg, a physicist who had been studying portals and dimensions. He said, they're real. And we don't quite yet understand how they work, but we know that they're there. How many dimensions are there? Could be unlimited. How they move back and forth is the question. It's generally believed that they can take some things with them when they cross dimensions. Or when they use a portal, they can take somebody with them in that portal. And what he said that they were studying it about, studying the topic about a group of eight of them internationally, was to see if they could get control of a portal somehow. So they put it over a tank and make the tank go away in war. And he said that they, they're past the, he said that we're way past the point if they're real, Dave. We're trying to understand the mechanics of how they work. And I found that fascinating. So really after I got done meeting with Brandenburg and that vanished show I did for the History Channel, you can watch it on, uh, on uh, Amazon. I didn't have any part in that. History Channel owns it. I just made the appearance, did the show, and they own all the residuals. But I remember flying home from Wisconsin with my head ready to explode. I actually had a tremendous headache. Not because of Dr. Brandenburg. He was super accommodating. Was polite enough to speak at my level so I understand what he said. And it was just coming face to face the reality of some of these things. In the back of my mind, I always kind of knew. But then when somebody in authority who's an expert in that arena says something and he works for NASA as a contract physicist, well, then he definitely has the credentials. Stunning. So, I hope this class was meaningful in that I gave you that wide view of all of the topics in this cryptid world. And all of the similarities to them, what they have, what they don't have, what we get, what we don't get. And then they magically disappear. 
and all the sightings stop. And then suddenly, you can't track it, you can't predict it, suddenly they reappear somewhere else. Somebody asked me the other day, do I think Bigfoot migrates? No, I don't. I think that they can move in and out of this dimension and into another area very rapidly. How they manage that? If Brandenburg didn't know, then I sure as heck don't know. That's outside my pay grade. But I will tell you that I'm fascinated on the topic. It, it explains so much of this world. And when you think of hard science that they're talking about, that they're validating, then you either ignore that and you go back to believing, oh, it's just a dumb animal and, you know, we'll catch it. Now, if it was a dumb animal, it would have been caught a long time ago. And it's not. And it hasn't been. And it won't. Somebody, other, somebody else asked, well, Dave, are you ever afraid that, you know, these pro-kill people are going to kill Bigfoot? <laughs> no. <laughs> are you kidding? <laughs> I actually think I, it's funny. It might, I mean, it's very sad that these people have nothing to do in life other than trying to go kill Bigfoot. But do I ever think they will? No. They'll kill, they'll kill each other before they kill a Bigfoot. So, that's the end of this class. We covered a lot of important area. I hope you share this with your friends on the outside. And uh, please make sure you're subscribed to this channel, Can I Missing Project? And uh, if you look on the lower left-hand corner of your screen where it says Can I Missing at the end of this video, if you click on that, it'll take you to all the other videos we have. There's 400 plus. And uh, hopefully you'll watch the classes on Bigfoot 101. And then you can follow me on uh, Twitter, David Politis at can -Am Missing. Our Bigfoot website, NA, like North America, nabigfootsearch.com. There's a store there. All of our books are in stock. And I, I'm a very blessed person today because you are watching and you are engaged. Thank you for your friendship. Be nice to your fellow man. Do something when you're at the store to help somebody else. That's our motto. Have a great day. Politis out.